there's never been a better time to have Sirius XM. With even more exclusive content, we've over 150 channels in your vehicle, including the widest, deepest variety of music, ad-free. Root for your team. Get news. Listen to whatever makes you laugh. And hear all about your favorite stars. Your Platinum Plan offer includes more than ever before to enjoy online, on your phone, or at home. Create your own ad-free personalized stations powered by Pandora. Hear ad-free extra channels filled with music and enjoy a favorite shows with Sirius XM Video. Thousands of hours of shows and performances on demand. What you love is on now. So Audison recently released a brand new version of their BitTune software. It was 3.1, and man, was it loaded with some new features. This is our very first workshop. This got me pretty pumped. We've got expert trainer Ken Ward in the house to show you guys all about the new features of BitTune 3.1, how to use it, how to measure with it, and all that good stuff. This is CMA Workshop presented by SiriusXM, Audison, and it starts now. <laughs> Hey guys, what's going on? And thanks for tuning in to this CMA workshop where it's time to get your learn on and where we bring in an expert to show you exactly how it's done step by step in any by any means necessary. And of course, today we are blessed enough to have expert trainer Ken Ward from Electro Media, of course, covering both Audison and Hertz, but specifically today in the house to talk to us about the latest release 3.1 of BitTune. So if you're into DSP, which of course you should be, this is probably one you don't want to miss. So before that, let's go ahead and bring our first guest on. He is Steve Colomb, and he is the product manager over at Automobility, um, the Canadian distributor for Audison. Hey, Steve, how are you? Hey, Ben. Good you? I'm pretty excited because this is kind of like a big deal for us. It's a, a workshop has always been a really, really highly popular platform for us. It's, it's where we get an opportunity to really get down and dirty and show how things are done, how things work. And uh, we've got an interesting one today because we're talking about a software update um, from Audison uh, in the DSP side of things. But before we get started, I heard there were some recent trainings that went down at the Automobility Mothership. How'd that go? Correct. Uh, it went pretty good. After a year and a half of waiting due to all the circumstances that we know about <laughs> and, yeah. uh, you know, the limitations we had, it was good to finally have an in-person training with Ken for our staff, tech staff, and also the sales force. Um, you know, I'm a visual person. Uh, you know, we can do so much on Zoom. I mean, and, you know, in person, it's always different. You have to, you know, experience the feel to hear the difference that's the most important thing mm. about dsp to hear the difference so no it was very pretty good, good. It went very, it went very, very well cool. yeah. so a whole bunch of people got together there and he actually showed up which is cool and did that in person like you said um but for for dealers tuning in you know obviously they're tuning into this there's already an interest right but like how important from your perspective is dsp to understand from a dealer perspective these days well as we've been talking about in the past year or two years you know Moving forward in the audio business, you will have no choice pretty much to use DSP with the way the cars are made right now and moving forward as well. Um, you know, DSP is pretty much will be the future of car audio at some point uh, due to all the limitations of the infotainment systems in the cars, trucks. Uh, you know, there's no really way around it uh, in some cases. Uh, and this is why, you know, we're going to see a lot with Ken uh, in the following minutes. Uh, Lots of slides explaining exactly where and how to uh, to address this uh, those yeah. issues. I have a funny feeling he's going to go pretty in depth about that question that we just asked right there. So uh, exactly, yeah, absolutely. Let's bring in the specialist. Um, he's geared up for uh, to to literally go through this top to bottom. You know, so I encourage you take your notepad out. This is the one where you're going to really learn something here. Um, let's go ahead and bring him on. He's our expert uh, in the house, Mr. Ken Ward. What's going on, sir? Hey, Ben. It's great to see you. Great Take to care. see you. I can't believe you actually made time to do this. You've been traveling. I follow your Facebook. You're like everywhere all at once. 
it, it, we are making up for lost time as best we can. And we have a lot going on the next few months as well. So, uh, but I, I'll always make time for you guys. Well, that's, that's appreciated very much, sir. And uh, I would just talk to Steve here, how you were actually in Canada. Why don't you tell us about your recent visit? Um, I've been quite, I've been around quite a bit. I've been uh, a couple of trips to the West and, and one trip out to the East and, uh, it was great time and it was great to, um, meet the, the techs, at, at automobility uh, and work on cars together. Um, mm. as, as, as Steve has said, it's one thing to show people something over zoom, but when you can, uh, have them watch in person and then listen to the car. And that's really the, the, the thing that I have found that makes the biggest difference for, for techs is when they can hear what they've done. Uh, this is not like YouTube where you're listening to somebody's exhaust note. Uh, mm -hmm. This is something that you can't just, you can't get over a phone. You, you've got to hear it and, and feel it. So mm -hmm. um, when I've done a, tra when I do a training and somebody says, how did you get the base up in the windshield like that? Or um, that only took 30 minutes. Uh, those are things that I don't think people believe when I say them, you know, I, I'm just some guy, right? But if you watch somebody set up a car in 30 minutes, that, that's, that's exciting. So I was very positive with the results. And there's obviously a lot of Canadian techs uh, I met who are really eager to get their arms around this stuff. So you had a chance to talk with several different de uh, retailers from across the country. And uh, what is some of the feedback? I mean, obviously you had a chance to work one-on-one -on -one with them. Um, the feedback was very positive. In two different instances, uh, we had store owners after uh, a bit to an explanation uh, commit to obtaining more. Uh, a lot of our training has been, uh, as I think you mentioned at the beginning, the Bittune as a testing device has been out for, for quite a while. It's actually been out for nine years. Um, but with this software update, well, well, we've been training people who already own it. Uh, but if someone has multiple stores, then they may want to have uh, one at more than one location. And that's what we have found is that with the new value set, we, um, I think we probably tripled the number of things wow. that it does. Um, but we also focused really clearly on two areas where measurement is helpful. And I'm, I'm sure we'll be able to go into that in a minute. Amazing, amazing. I'm really excited about this one, Ken. Okay, so when our appetite, what's on the menu du jour today? Uh, so I'm going to talk about the, the two most complex parts of our business today for audio, which are figuring out what the factory system is doing and then tuning it at the end. And these are the two parts that you need to know about DSP. Um, and I'll tell you a story. In 2018, I did my first work with uh, Audison. And they contacted me and said, would you come to Canada and train some dealers in DSP and OEM? And I said, yes, I'd be happy to do that. But I need you to know that I'm going to be telling dealers how to use test equipment beyond the bit tune. And they said, why, why would you do that? The bit tune does so many things. And I said, it does, it does a lot of things, but there's certain things that I've been teaching for, for several years that it doesn't do that I think are essential. And so I'm going to have to go off the reservation and explain how to use these other tools. And they said, okay, uh, no problem. Uh, but last year the question was raised, can we close that gap? So I can now say with 100% sincerity that the Bittune can do all of the tests that I've been recommending for over 10 years. That, okay, that nice. if uh, there may be some devices, like for instance, if you're measuring voltage, a handheld voltmeter is the most efficient way to measure voltage, right? But in it, if you have a bit tune, there isn't anything else that you will need to have other than a way to play signals through the car, a, a, a USB stick or a CD. And after that, we've got you covered. So it's an all-in-one Swiss Army knife tool set ready to go now. Now. It, it, it is a Swiss Army knife in that it has a lot of tools. And some of them, if you were going to cut down, a, a, cut, a cut a branch off a tree, there might be a better tool somewhere but we've right. got one. 
Um, but in this case, we actually added a couple of big saw blades. So nice. uh, just to take that analogy and stretch it right to the edge. Um, <laughs> but I think you'll like what we have. Well, I'll tell you, um, we've heard the buzz about it. Now we're going to hear from the horse's mouth exactly how we can extract all these new features and how to apply them, um, you know, to do what they're supposed meant to do. So, uh, Steve, on that note, if you have no other questions, I'd like to get uh, Ken set up here so we can dive into this workshop. And uh, without further ado, Ken Ward, you have the stage. All right. Well, <clears throat> the first thing that I want to talk about is the concept behind the Bitune, because a lot of people may have been exposed to it sometime over the past nine years in one of its previous versions. And, and basically what a Bittune is, is a USB sound card, a high-end USB sound card um, that has two channels and has a lot of hardware attached to the outside. And so when we originally launched the Bittune, it did a lot of things. And one of the things that it did, which was a big focus, was that it can test the distance to the speakers and enter them into our DSP processors. And it could also automatically equalize our DSP processors after that to whatever target curve you selected. And at the time, we didn't have a default target curve. It was just flat. And we didn't talk a lot about creating your own target curve. So not that many people change the target curve. And so as we know, a flat uh, tune system doesn't really sound that great. So one of the upgrades that we made is that we have the Audison default target curve uh, preloaded and you can create your own and export them and import them and things like that. But let me explain one of the reasons that we added this functionality to help dealers with the bit tune. Um, first of all, I don't use auto-tune features very often. I am pretty good at this, and I don't think it takes me very long, and so I would rather tune manually. And we have an awful lot of manual tune functions now built into the BitTune. But I want to show why we started off with OEM integration. Um, in this diagram, you can see that we have a factory head unit, an OEM source head unit, going into a DSP processor. And then we go into our amplifier, and those, those might be combined. In a lot of products today, those are one module. And then we go to the speakers, and then we can, we can hear it. Now, let's see here. If this has processing in it, and nowadays it all has processing in it. In the old days, it used to be equalization and maybe some crossovers. Now we're seeing a lot of phase processing. So if there is processing in that unit and we don't catch all of it, maybe we don't find all the wires, maybe we don't realize that phase differs left and right, or maybe we just make a, a, a standard human mistake and we get two wires backwards. Okay. So in, um, we didn't have a way to test that. We didn't have a way built into the BitTune to test that. Now, the way that you use the bit tune when you're going to do automatic tuning, and this is not just us. This is how any device that does automatic tuning, like REW uh, is designed to do this as well. You, you connect your test tones directly to the DSP. You don't play them through the factory system. You inject them directly into the DSP. And when you play them, they don't pass through the OEM processing. So... They go through the DSP processor, and then they go to our amplifier, and then they go to our speakers. And so when we use our automatic EQ, it might have amazing results when you're using that, in, that auxiliary input. But it doesn't mean it will have incredible results when you're using the OEM source. If we didn't get all the processing, or if we made a mistake ourselves. And we found that there were a lot of instances where the bit tune was being used to tune a system, whether it was being tuned manually or even worse, if it was being tuned automatically, where it wasn't ready to tune. And there wasn't any pro uh, mention in the process of how to find this. If you, with our system, we have a media player built into the bit tune. So you could listen to the system using music through the bit tune connection before you unplug it. 
And that would allow you to say, hey, this song sounds awesome when I play it through the bit tune, through the aux input. It doesn't sound good when I listen to it through the factory radio. There's some kind of difference there. But we didn't really have that built into our process. And not that many people tried it. So that is something that we decided we needed to change. So let me give you a little bit of background on, on some acoustics. First of all, as most of you know, microphones change pressure into voltage. Air pushes on the microphone, my microphone sends voltage something. And real-time analyzers really don't measure sound. They measure voltage. And we use them with microphones plugged into them a lot of the time. But more and more often, we are using them without microphones plugged into them, and we're finding the voltage in some other way. But you can think of a real-time analyzer as a bunch of voltmeters that are all set to AC voltage. And you can, and each one of those uh, voltmeters is only able to see one specific frequency. And that's what the bit tune does when it's in RTA mode. It, it acts as a very sophisticated voltmeter. So here's an example in one-third octave resolution. Um, you can see in this example that there is more voltage here and here, and there is less voltage here and here. And this particular signal was created using electrical inputs, not a microphone. So this tells us what the factory may have done to make certain notes louder than other notes. So before I get, go too far, I'm going to show you a really cool table and then an a, a uh, animation to explain something about summing identical waves. And you'll, you'll see what I mean in a moment. Stick with me for just a sec. If you have two speakers and they're playing the same sound and they are in phase with each other, let's say you have two subwoofers and they're in a box and they're right next to each other and they're, they're hooked up properly. When you play both of them, they will be 6 dB louder than if you play just one or the other. Now, if you have two speakers and somehow they get 90 degrees out of phase, which in our business generally happens when they're in different locations, then they only get 3 dB louder. Now, it's good that they still got louder, but we lost 3 dB somewhere, and that's a really big deal because we know that 3 dB is equivalent to doubling your amplifier power. So at, at, if we have two speakers that are 90 degrees out of phase, we lost some power. If they're 120 degrees out, playing more speakers doesn't result in getting louder at all. And that's a big problem because we do a lot of systems with a lot of speakers. And the idea is that we can hear it when it's on the road. We don't want to put a bunch of speakers in the car and not have it get any louder. 150 degrees, we're actually going backwards. If we're 150 degrees out of phase, we've actually made the sound quieter than it would have been otherwise. And if we have two speakers that are 180 degrees out, they almost completely cancel each other out. And everyone that's an installer who has put two subwoofers in one box has had this experience where you accidentally hook a speaker up backwards. When you hook the polarity up backwards on, two sub on one subwoofer, you do put them 180 degrees out of phase. And all of a sudden, all your bass disappears. And finally, if you somehow get speakers 360 degrees out of phase, they sound just the same as they did at the beginning. At, we're going to go back to their, their 6 dB louder. So this is the most complex topic we have in our, in our business. A phase is very confusing. And I found this animation that I think you might like. Um, the top wave here, let's say that that's the left speaker. And the second wave, let's say that that's the right speaker. And the thick wave is those waves added together. And we're going to, to change to different frequencies. And we're going to show you right here that at that point, boom, they're louder. But at this point, boom, they're gone. And at this point, boom, they're louder. So depending on how far away a speaker is and what frequency it's playing, we can get a louder result. We can get a result that is the same, or we can get a result that is actually quieter or almost completely canceled out. And that is the big thing that we use DSPs to overcome that we have problems with our frequency response because speakers are scattered around the car and they're different distances away. 
Now, this is a, a, an example of that problem. The, the, I took this on a bit too. You can see that there's a blue and a red line here, and the blue and the red line are almost perfectly on top of each other all the way across. And that uh, the blue line is the left channel, and the red line is the right channel. And it looks like they match each other perfectly in amplitude or in voltage. But I used this function of the bit tune, this green button up here, left plus right, and I added these two signals together. And you can see that when you add them together, you get a really horrible response at a bunch of frequencies. We went up 6 dB on the left side, and then we have a big dip. And that big dip shows that we are 180 degrees out of phase at 250 hertz and also at 750 hertz, and also at 1,250 hertz. And if you've ever hooked up two subwoofers and one of them was hooked up backwards, you know that once you have a phase cancellation problem, you can't get rid of it by taking your equalization and boosting it up. You can't get rid of it with your volume by playing it louder. You have to actually fix the phase cancellation at the source, by, in this case, by hooking up your, your subwoofer correctly. But if we put speakers in the doors, this is a pretty good example of what happens. We have one speaker that in this case is 27 inches farther away than the other speaker. And at these frequencies, the two speakers are canceling each other out. Now, once this happens, we can't fix it with EQ. We can't fix it with the EQ in our head unit. We can't fix it with the EQ in our DSP. We have to use some other method to solve this problem. And what we usually use is delay. Now, the factory, the OEM folks are very aware of this. This, this problem affects their system as well, but they don't like to use delay. And the reason they don't like to use delay is because delay works for the driver, but it doesn't really work for other seats that well. So sometimes they will use other methods to try to address this problem instead of delay if those methods give you similar results in both front seats. And, and they would rather actually accept a compromised result in both front seats over a superior result in one seat that doesn't work well in the other seat. And, and that's a pretty good uh, description of delay. So... I'm gonna show you what we are teaching as our full range OEM test process in 2022. Uh, the first thing that you need to do is research the car. The second thing you need to do is listen to the car to determine what they're doing to the processing. Then you need to find the audio wires. That's a pretty standard thing. Then you need to test them for content, voltage, delay, and phase. And all of these things are things that the BitTune will now test for you. And you should repeat step three and step four until you have a full range signal. That's how you know how many wires you're going to need to take care of in the car. And number five, if you have any channels you need to sum together to get full range, you can use the bit tune to test sum them together to make sure what polarity you should use when you wire them. And number six, review your plan and make sure what you have found in your testing will actually work with your plan. And if it doesn't, you should change your plan. And number seven, connect everything and make it work. And number eight, test and confirm that the integration worked the way you want before you start tuning the car. Now, number eight is really important because prior to the software update, the bit tune wasn't set up to do this. And now it is. And we're going to show you some examples of this right now. So we go through this in our training in more detail. But here's an example of taking the bit tune and plugging in the speaker level test probes, which look just like voltmeter test probes, and probing the wires that come out of the speaker wires that come out of a factory radio. And this is what you would do to make sure what is being done on the factory radio. Now, in a more complicated system, you have a factory amplifier and you have speakers. And if you can use the factory output to the amplifier, you, sh you should test and see if you can. Um, the older designs, that's an analog signal that varies in volume, and so we can use it. In the newer systems, it's either a digital signal that we can't use, or it's often an analog signal that is fixed in level, doesn't change with volume, 
and also doesn't have mixed into it the hands-free audio or the nav audio or the chimes and those things all get added in inside the amplifier and in that case we can compare the output of the amplifier to figure out which one we have to use. The tough part here is that most of the processing in an amplified factory system usually happens in the amplifier. So once we are reduced to using the outputs of the factory amplifier, the types of processing we're going to be exposed to are that much more uh, advanced, uh, especially considering that in the factory amplifier, that's where most cross active crossovers are. And so the odds of finding a full range signal once you go to the amplifier are much reduced. So here is an example of the electrical RTA when you're doing this sort of test on a bit tune. And in the upper left corner, you can see that we have selected the, the button that has a speaker with wires coming out of it. Um, I don't think that icon is too subtle. Um, you can see next to it that there is an icon for a microphone and that's ghosted out. Uh, when you first open the real-time analyzer, that's the one that's defaulted is the microphone icon. So you click on the uh, button for the speaker level and then below that, you can select the speed of the RTA. I like to use the slow setting and the band division button, which is the resolution of the uh, RTA. And in this case, I'm using 1 12th octave. And I've also selected the line mode instead of the bar mode, because that's much better for looking at multiple traces at the same time. Now, in this particular uh, example, you can see right here, it says RCA in. There's a switch on the top of the bit tune. And if you flip that switch to RCA, that's what you see here. You get one volt, 10 volts, or 100 volt options. If you flip the switch to speaker, which we may have a speaker uh, option I'll show you in a little bit, this scales up to 10 volts, 100 volts, and 1,000 volts. Trust me, you're not going to need 1,000 volts of amplifier capability when you're testing. But it's really cool for me to get to say that. Um, now, when you go over to the upper right, you will see that there is a left input, which is the one that's active. That's the blue line. And then there is a right input, which is a red line. And then there's the option of looking at the two added together or subtracted from each other. And I'll show you why the subtraction or the difference mode is really important in a couple of minutes. We, in the lower right, you can see that we, we have a voltage reading. We have a, a RMS voltage reading and a peak to peak voltage reading. And there's actually a signal meter along the right edge. Uh, there's a play pause button in the upper right as well. And I think that those are all new features because, well, of course they're new features because the electrical RTA wasn't here until 3.1 dropped. So this is all new. Uh, you'll also notice that it's a very large display. The RTA in previous versions was about the size of a postcard. And uh, we now allow you to make the RTA full size. And that really works out well for people. Well, first of all, it works out for everybody when you're doing it on your laptop. But if you have an external monitor, it is really cool to have a full screen RTA like this. So the signal that we're looking at here is a flat response. This is pink noise with no equalization and no processing of any kind. And it's full range. There's no crossovers applied. Now you can see that in the higher frequencies, it's very smooth. And in the lower frequencies, is it is a little bit ragged. And this is due to the random nature of pink noise. Uh, the way that pink noise is created is you have a random number generator uh, that creates a bunch of different frequencies. And that's why the longer you average your pink noise, the smoother it looks. This is one of the reasons that I select the slow speed when I'm using the electrical RTA. Now, here is an example of a wire, a speaker wire that you can find in a car that is not a good wire if you are just doing a simple sub add installation. You can see that you've got content down to about 250 hertz. And above 250 hertz, there's plenty of signal. It is pretty equalized, uh, but there's plenty of signal. But there's a pretty steep roll off here, about 40 dB of roll off. Uh, you can see that this does not have anything approaching subwoofer base content. This is actually an example of the kind of signal you would find 
on the rear four inch speaker in a BMW. Um, uh, I think this was out of a BMW with bass audio, uh, this particular uh, signal capture. And you'll notice if you look in the lower right that we've got this left channel is bright red. The reason that left channel is bright red is that we've actually over, uh, we're actually into clipping the input. Um, that's the indication that you get. And if you look up here at the upper right, you'll see that there is an indication here that the left channel is clipping. That tells you you're running too much voltage in and you should back it off or flip the switch on the top to speaker so that you can use different attenuation. So what if, if, you, if you're trying to add a subwoofer and you don't test the wire and you found this wire uh, and you then you put everything back together and listen to it, you would have wasted a lot of your time. And this is one of the problems that we're seeing today with dealers all over the, the world is that you've budgeted a certain amount of time for the job. You've done most of the job physically and you've spent most of the time that you've budgeted and that you're getting paid for. But when you test it, you don't get the results you're expecting. And then you have to take things apart and troubleshoot and figure out what to do differently. And that's when you start working for free. And we, none of us can afford that. So this is an example of a wire that would not be a good wire if you're adding a subwoofer. So you keep looking, you look for more audio wires. This is a wire that actually would be pretty good for adding a subwoofer. I will point out that it has a big old spike at about 50. And this is pretty common for factory subwoofer uh, outputs. They're really good at boosting one note and having one note bass. There's a couple of different things you can do to make that subwoofer sound a little better. But if you're just adding a subwoofer, that might not be the goal of the user. They might just be looking for louder bass. They might not be looking for incredibly smooth or, or flat bass. Uh, but this is the correct wire. And so testing the wires will add a couple of minutes to the job. But that's nowhere near the amount of time you add to the job if you assemble the entire system with the wrong signal for what you need. Now, in this example, the red and the blue uh, lines are, once again, those are pink noise that are not processed at all. And if they are identical in phase and they're identical in amplitude, when we add them together, we ought to get 6 dB more signal. And I'm going to use this button up here, this left plus right button, to do that. And when I do that, you will see that's exactly what I get. Um, the green button is plus 6 dB everywhere. And that means there's no phase equalization. There's no all-pass filters. There's no delay being applied. This signal is exactly what we need to tune. And by the way, there's a cursor button right here. I'm not going to demonstrate it right now. But if I click on the cursor button, when I go to any point on the chart, it will tell you the dB value and it will tell you the frequency. So I can very easily go through and compare all the way along these two lines and see, yes, that is indeed a 6 dB difference. Now, this is an, a good example of the output of a head unit with a crossover. It's not full range, bad source for a subwoofer ad. Here is the example of the other output. It, notice this one is 80 hertz and down. This would be perfect for a sub. Now, we can look at these both at the same time. And this is the left channel and the right channel in the upper right, both being enabled. And when I look at these, you can see that they cross over right here at 80 hertz. Now, I created these on the bench using a DSP. And I just want to point out that this is where the term crossover actually comes from, is when these two traces on the display are crossing over each other. So if I want to see if I've hooked these up correctly, um, and this doesn't mean that you haven't hooked them up the way the wiring diagram says. That's not my point. If you had a plot, you don't know what kind of crossover the factory applied. And when you sum crossover signals back together, they could be out of phase at the crossover point electrically, and they might not. You have to test. You can't predict. So in this particular case, they're not in phase at the crossover point. All of a sudden, if you look at 80 hertz, you can see that we've got a big old dip that wasn't there before. Now, 
that's using left plus right. You can see up in the upper right corner, we've used the addition mode. So instead of flipping the wires physically, going into our BitTune to see what happens, we can actually just click on the button next to it and use the difference mode instead of the addition mode. And once we do that, boom, now we can see that we have a really nice smooth result that will work just fine. Now, the, the Audison processors have a process called DEQ. And what DEQ does is it sums any channels that need to be summed together back together, and then it equalizes that response back to uh, a flat response. And it will take care of most of the problems like what you just saw. So testing for polarity hasn't been something that we've talked about that much when you sum things back together. However, what I have found is that you get better results if you start with the smoothest signal possible. So figuring out which way to wire the speakers is really important. And in this case, what you would do when you actually wire this up to your, to your DSP processor is you would invert the polarity on the, the woofer wire compared to the mid and high wire. Now, this is an example that we have done uh, for a lot of our dealers. By the way, this is actually the output of a Toyota Tacoma head unit. And you can see over here on the left, we have switched the switch on top to the speaker input. We are using the speaker input probes that come in the kit. Um, and I've got it set to 10 volts, which is the, the correct setting for head unit output. And we're testing the left channel. You can see that right here. And you can see on the left channel, there is a lot of equalization applied to this signal. And at this particular example, there is also some bass roll off. At lower volume settings, there's actually a stronger bass, but we're just gonna look at it at this one volume setting for a moment. And you can see in the lower right, the voltage is higher than it was. We're at like roughly four volts of peak to peak output, and we're not clipping because we switched to speaker. So now I'm going to switch to the right channel and you can see it's similar in voltage. It is not identical in the equalization curve. If I look, show you both of them, you can see that above about 600 right here, they are almost identical all the way up. There is one place where the left channel has a reduction right here. And you can see that below 600, there is some slight variations in the equalization until you get down to about 50 Hertz. And below 50 Hertz, they're perfectly identical. Why are they different? I'm not really sure. And the reason that I'm not really sure is that when I tested the, this is in a first, um, sorry, this is in a third generation Tacoma in the uh, Entune head unit that was actually made by Panasonic. And uh, I've tested later model head units that are uh, have CarPlay and no CD slot, and the equalization curve in that head unit is identical left and right. So I'm not sure why in this instance, left and right are different, but they sure are. Now I'm going to add these together and we're gonna find out what happens with this signal when I add them together. And what you see here is the green line is 6 dB louder above 600, except for right here where the signals were not equal in amplitude. And it's 6 dB louder above 50, but between about 63 and 600, that wire didn't go up 6 dB. And between 160 and 600, it actually got quieter, didn't it? There's a big old dip in this signal when you electrically sum them together. And that is an indication that they're not in phase at every frequency. Now, why did Toyota do this? They did this because they knew this would make the speaker sound better in either front seating position. It would not make the speaker sound better if you sit in the middle, but nobody sits in the middle in a car. Everybody sits in one of the two uh, uh, main seating locations. And if this is what they've done, if they have put left and right out of phase at certain frequencies, it will help us when we add speakers. It'll help us when we add an amplifier and speakers. 
But if we add a DSP to make sure that we're back in phase at all the frequencies and we go to use delay to make sure that we're in phase at all the frequencies, we'll never find a delay setting that puts us back in phase at 250 hertz without putting us out of phase at all the other frequencies. And that can be mystifying. It can be a huge time sink in the installation bay because you're sitting there trying this over and over and you're thinking tape measures don't work. And that's not the case. The case would be that if the, all, the fre all the frequencies aren't in phase with, all the channels aren't in phase with each other at every frequency, delay will not give us the results we expect. And this is an OEM integration problem, but if we don't solve it, it becomes a tuning problem when we're trying to tune the car. So we have a couple of different ways to address this with our products. We have speakers that allow you to use factory crossover points in more complex instances, and we have some models that have D-phase on the input to correct phase problems. And we'll have more of those later this year. Now, if you don't know about it, that's when this is a big problem. So here is an example of delay. I think I showed you the same slide before. This is what you see if delay has been applied from the factory. And we used to be really worried about delay being applied from the factory. And it turns out it's not used very often on left, right imaging applications. Um, if you see this, if you test the left channel and you test the right channel and they match, and then you test both channels added together and you see this sort of result, check the head unit menu because I know of two head units, the Ford F-150 without a B and O and the Subaru Impreza without HK, where if you go into the tone menu, there is a button that says driver seat optimization. And if you turn it on, it activates delay like this. And if you turn it off, the delay goes away. I'm not saying their delay is bad or wrong. Okay. They know the dimensions of the car as well as we do. But if you, you don't want to stack two delay settings on top of each other, if you're actually not adding delay, if all you're doing is adding speakers or speakers and an amplifier, then their delay will help you. But if you want to uh, add your own DSP, then you want their delay turned off. And you're also going to want to show that to the customer so that they understand that they don't want to leave that button activated. Now, here is an example from a Honda Fit. I think this is a second generation Honda Fit. It might be a first generation Honda Fit, actually. And this is a deck power signal. And what we did was we tested the signal at two different volumes to make sure that it didn't change at different volumes. And I'm, uh, we, I'm a, the admin at the Educar uh, online Facebook group for sharing uh, test information. And the most common mistake that people make when they test a car is they forget to test at various volumes to see if the signal appreciably changes. And if the signal appreciably changes, you may need to add a master volume control so that you can avoid that. But if it doesn't, then you don't need to add the master volume control in most instances. So it's really useful to know whether or not that's uh, uh, required by the OEM processing. Now, I'm going to compare that to this one, which does change with volume. This is actually a mock-up of the 2004 to 2008 Acura TSX, which is a JDM Honda Accord. And, and I, we owned one of these for a really long time in my family. And at low volumes, there is a dip introduced at 1K. And at high volumes, it goes away. It flattens out. This is the auto loudness curve as defined by Fletcher and Munson. And it pretty much approximates how we hear. And you don't need to fix that either. If the only thing that changes when you go from a low volume to a high volume is that 1K comes up roughly to the level of everything else, then congratulations, you have a nice pleasing auto loudness feature and you really don't need to correct it. However, when we go to something like this, and this is actually in a Hyundai, I think it was a Santa Fe, and uh, at you can see here at low volumes, the treble is a little bit hotter. The mid-range is about the same. The mid-range here is about the same. But suddenly, in the upper bass, 
you can see there's a big difference as you raise the volume. At low volumes, the, there's a dip in the upper bass. And at higher volumes, there's a boost in the upper bass. Also at higher volumes, you can see that there is not a commensurate increase in the bass peak at 80. Uh, by the way, this is not an amplified system. This was a um, this was just a uh, deck power system. It didn't have much bass below around 60 hertz. So we actually use DEQ on this, but you get the best results in an application like this with an external volume control, leaving the volume at, at the factory radio at one particular level, tuning for that level, and telling the customer, hey, this, po this point right here is where it's going to sound its best. So we call our volume control a DRC, and this is not auto loudness. So once we've done this, once we've identified all the wires, we've run them into our processor, we've corrected them, now we need to make sure we get the results we want before we move on to the tuning process. So once again, left and right are blue and red, and they're identical. And if we get a result that's like this, we're ready to go on to the, to the tuning process. Now, this is the sort of thing that we would expect to see out of an aftermarket head unit once all of the tuning settings are defeated. And this is what we would expect to see out of an external preamp, which is available from a number of different companies covering a number of different cars. Our external preamp is called the Bit DMI, and it comes out in Toslink form. But you can see here that all the processing has been removed. And this means we are ready to tune the car. And that also means, by the way, that left and right are wired in proper polarity, which is always a nice thing to be sure of. They're in phase at every frequency, and they have the same arrival time. So this is a win. We are ready to go. So this is the first part of the upgrades to the bit tune, making sure the signal we have is ready to tune, whether we're using the auto-tune, auto-EQ features in the bit tune, or we're using our own manual process, which is the one that I often use. Now I'm gonna to go to the acoustic side. And when we go to the acoustic side, I'm gonna show you in the upper left, we have the microphone button selected. You can see in this particular example, I'm using a one third octave resolution and I'm using bars instead of lines. Um, you can see there's a, something here called HSM sweep, which I will explain in a moment. And there is also a target curve. You can see this orange line here is a target curve. And this is actually an early beta version of the 3.1 improved software. This little glitch right here has been corrected in our software. But the target curve is what we're going to use when we uh, tune the car. Now, if you look at this signal, and this is actually an example of a vehicle that I tuned uh, at a shop when I was testing the RTA functions. And if you look at this in one third octave, you might believe pretty easily that, oh, this signal can be saved. Like this, this is a signal that can be tuned and we can hit our target curve. But I'm gonna show you what it looks like in 124th octave resolution. 124th octave resolution is a really difficult resolution to use to tune a system because you see a lot of irregularities that we can't hear and that you shouldn't chase. But in this particular case, you can see that our signal actually drops completely off the chart at 160, 180 hertz. And that was a clue that before this car was tuned, we should investigate what was going on. It turned out that this was a BMW and the BMW was one of the newer BMWs where the amplifier and tuner are in one module and the crossovers are on all the time in that module, and they can't be defeated. And it turned out that the installer who did this car had preloaded a BMW file that was made for cars with a full range signal, one of the older BMWs. And so this signal right here was essentially the result of stacking two sets of crossovers on top of each other. So I could have tried to EQ this till the cows came home. I wasn't going to solve that big problem at 160, 180 hertz. So what I did was I went in and I um, turned off all the crossovers, passed through what we were using, went ahead and equalized each individual speaker on its own, and made the left and the right match. This isn't a tuning class, so I don't want to go through the entire tuning process, but we do have worksheets to help walk you through that. 
Um, and I also use this HSM sweep button. If, if you've ever seen the Bitune uh, head replacement microphone, it's what I call the flying saucer. It's about six inches across and it hangs on the headrest of the driver's seat. And it has five different microphones in it. And those five different microphones have always been part of our automated, uh, autom automated equalization measurement, but we haven't used them in the manual tuning. And the benefit of using five different microphones is that we can average out the frequency response at the five different positions. And we can make sure to eliminate through the averaging process any spurious results that shouldn't be taken into account when you tune the system. It's really the only uh, comfortable way to use a high resolution like 124th is if you can get rid of anything that you shouldn't have to chase. And I find this is especially important for those of us that haven't been tuning for years and don't have a lot of experience with high resolution. It makes you feel a lot more comfortable about when you should listen to the car. So when you click on the start button for HSM sweep, and by the way, HSM sweep assumes we're using pink noise uh, through the factory system. It will measure each of the five microphones 10 seconds at a time and the results are displayed, you can actually watch it. And then at the end of the 50 seconds, it averages them and shows you the static result. And it is a huge time saver, especially at the end when you've, made, you've tuned the right side to hit a target, you've tuned the left side to match the right side as best as possible, and now you want to see how it sounds when you play both sides. One thing I will mention also is that we have the ability to save measurements and then load them in the background. So we can actually tune the right side, save it, load it, and then make the left side match. When I say make the left side match, it's because a lot of times our, our systems are not perfect. They have some imperfections and we want those imperfections to be identical left and right when we're trying to, or rough or similar left and right when we're working on our stereo imaging. So. This is an example of a 124th resolution measurement where I have used the HSM spatial averaging. And you can tell that I have because in the left here, it says zero seconds are remaining on the HSM spatial average. And you can see here that we have followed this target curve pretty darn closely. It's a little bit hot in the treble and it was a little bit shy in the very lowest base. One of the reasons it was shy in the very lowest base is that the signal coming out of the factory system really didn't have any 20 hertz content. So we did our best to make that up. But this system really does sound amazing. It has great bass down to 32 hertz acoustically, and it doesn't have any significant dips or flaws uh, that take away from the tonality of the result. Uh, so this is... By the way, this is a good example of the cursor. You can see in the upper left, it says 32 hertz, 92 dB. That just happens to be the point that the cursor was at when I took this screenshot. So the reasons that we've added these features, number one, test the signal before you connect it to your DSP. That will tell you how many signals you need and what's being done to those signals. If you need to correct phase processing, you may need to change the equipment you're using to do it. If you have a car with advanced phase processing and the speaker system needs everything to be in phase, then you may need to change the DSP that you sold the customer. Or if you have a car like a uh, Toyota um, Tacoma um, that is out of phase at 250 hertz, there is a way to do that. Our sound pack does that without having deface. Um, so let's see, where are we? Let's see here. So oh, that is our last slide. So I'm going to go ahead and switch back over. So Ben, did that make sense? What kind of questions come from all that? Hey, Ken, first of all, that was, you know, I, I've sat through a lot of these, as you know, 
And a lot of the times we're talking about the feature set on the DSP itself. And this time was a refresh, refreshing for me anyhow, to go through the process of even analyzing and testing the signal before you even get into the DSP, which is neat because now you have a software that can do both, I'll call it the pre and the post settings. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, absolutely. Um, listen, this is going to be played back many, many, many times in pause and frame and, you know, exactly what it's supposed to be doing. Um, I guess more the, one of the questions that I had out of this whole thing is, you know, in the very beginning of the of the presentation or the training, you, you had mentioned that, you know, there are certain tools that would probably do rudimentary things maybe better, right? We we're talking about the tools and the tool set. However, after having sat through this, um, do I want to go back and freeze frame you on a couple of things? Yes, I do. I know that, you know, we went through this quite quickly, but I get it now. 3.1 has managed to get the feedback. I don't know if it's just from you, Ken, or from deal. I'm guessing there's some dealer feedback here that, that went along with developing the, the tools that were missing. Um, is there somewhere that we can just have a checklist of, hey, here's the new features added. Check, 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 check. Like that would um, be an interesting... Kind of I piece think of that we have, have a list like that. I think we have a list like that on the Bitune webpage. Mm -hmm. And I know that dealers, they're, they're, we have a tech tip, a one-page tech tip on the acoustic editions. And we have a different one-page tech tip on the electrical uh, editions. So those are definitely things that are available to dealers uh, to help them set up and use these features. Um, you mentioned how there was some more rudimentary ways to do this. The most common thing, and this is actually the case for, for what I was using as well. Um, one channel RTAs are the standard, whether you mm -hmm. have a handheld RTA or whether you have a, a, a tabletop RTA uh, that plugs into a PC, one channel RTAs are the standard. And one channel RTAs don't let you compare the phase between two channels unless you buy an external device to add them together before they come into your, RT, uh, your RTA. And if that's what you have, then, you know, great. Now, I used to make a device like that, and I think I sold a dozen. So um, the, the way that we added that functionality into the RTA, and I have to say, um, some of these were dealer requests, but the crew at Audison in Italy and R&D were amazing. Anything that we asked about, they were happy to, to provide to us as long as the hardware in the Bitune was already supporting it, and it, and it was. So uh, it is a little less convenient to test these wires with a box and a PC than it is with a handheld device. But it does reveal things that we won't see any other way. Fair enough, fair enough. And, and, and to, to have this um, system, Steve, I'm just gonna direct this question. Is this something the dealers can order, obviously, uh, and, and, and download? Um, what about more dealer trainings in the future? What are, what are we talking about here? Because obviously this is something that's going to be constantly developing. And um, we're at 3.1. So there's like 3.2 to 3.9 that still, could still come out. So I'm just wondering, like, what are the, how does this process work for dealers that might be tuning in? Well, I believe the 3.1 is going to go uh, for, a, a, I'd say, moderate to long term. Okay. Uh, because it's covering a lot of features that were requested, as Ken just mentioned. But yes, dealer trainings this year is something we want to put more emphasis on because, you know, now with everything happening, uh, things are getting back to normal-ish, let's mm -hmm. say it like that. So yes, uh, what you saw right now was just a glimpse of where and what we, we want to talk about in dealer trainings uh, in the next months. So Ken mentioned in the beginning, you know, he started to, uh, he, he came up here for a couple of visits out west. Mm -hmm out east and we'll keep doing it uh nice. throughout the year because we yeah. want to put a lot of emphasis on the, the dealer support uh to understand all the basics of it because it's very important to not just buy a bit to and then try to install it without any you know uh, uh not knowledge but uh the training absolutely uh, absolutely and, and you know what let's be honest ken this was a little bit of a condensed version, I know. Uh, there's It can go offshoot in so many different directions depending on the vehicle, depending on the circumstance of what you're dealing with. However, if I had to summarize this, Ken, and maybe I want to pass this over to you as, as a as a overall message from what you tried to demonstrate today, what is it that you want dealers to understand? That uh, upgrading factory sound doesn't have to be a mystery, mm -hmm. that you can measure what you're dealing with 
and what you end up with uh, more simply than you might imagine. Software based. Got to deal with the software, guys. Don't be scared of the software. You have to have the software. You know, what I mean, you it's, can't. it's 2022. I don't think it's going away. I don't. It's think not it's going away. But the good news is, people at Audison are, you know, from from what I saw here, making it easier and all more all in one. You don't need ten different devices to do this. You need one. Just learn it well. Learn it well and extract and use the tools out of it. So I will throw in a t uh, a teaser. You you mentioned versions later than 3.1 and i'm pretty mm -hmm. sure if there are versions later than 3.1 they will be just running changes to support mm -hmm. new product and then mm -hmm. next time i'm here maybe we'll get to talk about some of that keywords hashtag new product more on this later well he'll be back um ken i want to wish you you know safe travels i know you're all over the place thank you for taking the time with us today i know this one uh, will go a long way for dealers learning about the bit 3.1 and uh really excited for when you come back because uh, i know we've got some pretty exciting stuff down the pipeline thanks for having me ben take care ken um i don't know if anybody can do it better than that honestly like <laughs> for what it is you know what i mean it's not exactly you're, you're not doing like crazy sound pressure levels or anything like that but yeah. If you're in the business of selling car audio and you want to upgrade, you need to know how to do this. And I think Ken did a brilliant job with that, Steve. Yeah, we're blessed that we have him on board because, uh, you know, so much knowledge. And, you know, I could listen to Ken for 12 hours. Yeah, there's like, a, I there's have. I have new. listened to Ken for over 12 hours. No, I know, but you know what I'm saying. It, it's a <laughs> no, matter of... No, 100%. No, and he brings great examples, which are real-time examples that, you know, using real vehicle situations and so on and so forth. Yeah. And... Um, I didn't get a chance to say that. I should have mentioned it. But yeah, phase. It's all about the phase. And this, he mentioned it again today. It's a super important. Automobility in Canada distributed by, sorry, Audison in Canada distributed by Automobility. And of course, if you want more information on Audison products at large, check out audison.u. Uh, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us today and for bringing Ken to the table for this awesome workshop. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Ben. Uh, talk to you soon. Yep. I hope you guys certainly enjoyed that one. A lot of important information and of course this workshop series uh does that it delivers exactly that go back play it pause it watch it learn it that's what it's all about all right i want to give you guys some heads up um want to make sure you tune in tomorrow night because we're back with our monthly retailer roundtables we'll be uh talking about motorcycle and jeep categories we've gone out and and rallied five of the coolest retailers that delve into those categories and it's going down tomorrow night at 8 p.m industry roundtable presented by five axis innovations um in just a few short days we're going to start on to our next session this is a long one we're actually going to break it up into a few pieces here but for the next few weeks it's all about car audio it's going actually from thursday may 12th all the way to wednesday june 15th it's going to feature literally you name the brand that does car audio we're going to feature them on the show and we're going to break it down for you one brand at a time last but not least make sure to visit our newly redesigned website located at cmanetworks.com brand new interface you can search for your favorite content through either brand by category and yes your favorite trainer check out ken ward's profile every video we've ever collaborated on can be viewed right there under ken ward under the tab called trainers that's it thanks for tuning in to this cma workshop presented by SiriusXM. And as usual, I'm your host, Ben Wu. Until next time, we connect. Stop it. Stop it. Yo, roll it down. I am. You don't need a car to listen to Sirius XM. You can listen anywhere. You know that, right? What? Kevin Hart's laugh out loud Kevin, you could use your phone. What? What? Alexa, play Kevin Hart's laugh out loud radio on Sirius XM. What? This is how I know you're getting old. I guess that was it. What?